Thank you, thank you very much. It's really uh, a great pleasure for me, and thank you for inviting me, and uh, Christian Solidarity, uh, International Solidarity, John, thank you very much. It is really a great pleasure for me to be here and uh, share with you my new book, and this is the title of the book, and uh, I will be covering this evening with you the policy of the Ottoman authorities against the Christians during the beginning of the 20th century. I'm going to talk a very limited period of time, actually, but it will cover the entire 100 year, actually. You will see that the impact of these 10 years, uh, how important uh, in human history. And But before going into uh, some detail of these policies, policies of Ottoman authorities against the Christians in the early 20th century, I would like to uh, give you some information about the sources that I have used for my research. It is also really very interesting to look into it. And uh, I used uh, Ottoman collection of the Ottoman language document, basically, found in the Prime Ministerial Ottoman Archive in Istanbul extensively. And among its holdings, the interior ministry papers, those who know uh, Turkish, Dahiliye Nezareti Evrak, are crucial and contain a great deal of information directly relevant to our subject. I also made extensive use of the papers from the interior ministry's cipher office. What you are seeing here is, is an example of these from cipher office documents. And uh, what was the cipher office. I will talk a little bit what is all this about, uh, but you have to know that the cipher office was established 1913, just one year before the war started, and functioned as a separate office for the purpose of telegraphic communications between the central Ottoman administration and its various provincial functionaries. So the communication was in form of short telegraphic messages that included the orders of the central government and they were encoded, ciphered these telegrams. And these ciphers were also changed regularly. And what you see here, there are, they use different kind of papers actually. Uh, in the next one maybe uh, you will see that Uh, here you don't see any city name, as you see, only city names written with hand. But uh, the first document that I uh, wanted to show is, as you see in the first document, there is a written provinces, and they really uh, uh, deleted the cities that it should not go. So this is how the ministry worked. The city names is already there, and uh, they they crossed the names that they should not go, and to all other that existed in these cities, the telegrams should go. And you have to also understand the importance of this uh, office, uh, cipher office, because these were the short orders sent by telegrams, couple of sentences. You have to understand because during this, those days, to travel from Istanbul to any provinces in Eastern Anatolia, usually took three, four weeks. So in order to send a circular or any written document from Istanbul to Erzurum or Kars, or Kars was under Russian occupation, but any other Eastern provinces, it usually took one month at least. We know that from the memoirs also. And so just before the war started, they set up this institu institution within the uh, interior ministry to send short orders. And sometimes they use this saying that the main document is on its way, it's coming. So then this is crucial for us to understand the Armenian genocide because basically the, throughout the deportation period, they use these cipher documents to communicate with the regions on daily basis. And another important information that you have to know, it was not only the interior ministry used these channels. All other ministries used these also. This is my next. Uh, oh, let me uh, 
talk about it. This is how the documents went to the provinces, ciphered, and this is how the local uh, individual, the uh, in the telegram office took this and gave to the governor office. And there was another individual there uh, working in the uh, government office. And he knew this cipher and translated this into modern Ottoman language. Then they knew what was. Here is an example why we know this. This is a telegram actually coming from Aleppo to Istanbul. This is from an individual whose name uh, very important for Turks also because he became the interior minister during uh, 1930s and he was responsible, maybe those who are Kurds here, Şükrü Kaya, who was responsible for the relocating of Kurds in Dersim area also 1930s. So he was also in charge of resettlement of the Armenians and he was sending this telegram from Aleppo, November 1915. And as you see actually, telegram came with certain numbers to, the, uh, to Istanbul and the uh, officers wrote on top of the telegrams actually uh, the meaning of these documents. This is how we could then encipher today and uh, we can we could read this document. So uh, as I mentioned, <coughs> this is for example an important telegram from the Ministry of Education and in telegram they say that please encipher this telegram and coded this telegram based on interior ministry's coded codes and this telegram is about, maybe if I had time, I will talk longer on this, on the assimilation of Armenian children. And it was sent early, before this was sent to certain provinces, uh, where, uh, in eastern provinces where the Armenians were sent, and this telegram was sent before Armenians had already been sent. And very important because in telegram says, there will be some children orphanages, and give us the numbers. So they were preparing actually for the orphan Armenian children. And if I had time, I will talk about it. And this is from education ministry. This means, I mean, these are very important fine details, but you have to understand. There was a cabinet meeting. There must be a cabinet meeting. In cabinet meeting, there must be a decision about education and the orphanages. And after this decision, education ministry took this issue in hand and used the cipher office to send these short telegram to the regions. So these are the basic documents that I used throughout my research. And what all these materials tells us on the Armenian uh, genocide. But basically, uh, let me, this is the uh, telegram's English version and secret and to be deciphered according to the Interior Ministry Cipher Office code. This is the site on the telegram. And then telegram says, since consideration has been given to the idea of the education and upbringing of children, you will see that I will show you bakım ve terbiye. This is the two Turkish words that they used extensively for the children. And this is the education and upbringing of Armenian children, and since the idea of education and upbringing of the children under the age of 10, and again, think of it, the deportation hasn't started yet. So this is also important for you to understand the, how the mechanism worked in the Ottoman government. So the considerations are there for the education and upbringing of the children under age of 10 of those Armenians who have been relocated or in the same fashion deported either through the establishment of an orphanage or gathering of them into an already existing orphanage, report back with all haste, because they want to have the preparation, how many such orphan children there are within the province. So the estimation before they sent the children they won't have in Istanbul. So this is the, uh, so you can understand now whether Armenian genocide or the policy towards Christian as Turkish government argues war measures. And it shows you this is, it has nothing to do with war. This is really pre-planned uh, general policy, which I'm going to talk also, which is a demographic policy, a poli uh, population policy. So what are all these telegrams tells us? The telegrams says that I'm going to start with Greek case 1913 and go over the Armenian case. Uh, 
as you know, it is always difficult to pinpoint a historic uh, date, a beginning date in any social process because any event that you think designates the beginning, it is always the result of the events uh, that preceded it. So nevertheless, for our case, let's open the scene in the Ottoman Empire with the end of Balkan Wars 1912-13, as the empire was confronting its greatest loss. I have to add also, throughout the 19th century, Ottoman Empire actually lost approximately 60% of its territory before coming to Balkan War. And 1912-13, within one month, October 1912, Ottoman Empire lost more than 80% of its European territory. Imagine one night you woke up, 80% of Switzerland gone. It's not there in order to understand the psychic of the Ottoman rulers. 80% of Ottoman territory and nearly 70% of the European population was lost and this was then the idea came to the Union and Progress Party, the ruling part of that period, that the collapse of the empire is imminent. That is approaching, the end of the empire. So, for example, it was not only the feeling of the ruling elite. In 1913, after the Balkan War, uh, there is a newspaper, there was a newspaper, Tanin. It, is the, it was the central organ of the Union and Progress Party. And in Tanin, 1913, you could read the headlines like, it is impossible to save Anatolia from the destiny awaiting Rumelia. So Rumelia is the Balkan, we lost the Rumelia, and it is then the newspaper says it is impossible to save the Anatolia from the same destiny. And after losing Balkan, they believed now the time was ripe for the same feature to occur in Anatolia, which was the home of large Christian population. So you have to also remember one thing, 1913-14, Christian made up approximately 25, 30% of the Ottoman population in Anatolia. It was not a small minority. It was altogether 25, 30%. And there were some cities in Eastern Anatolia, like Van, were then Armenian in majority, or some cities in West, uh, like Smyrna, were Greeks were in majority. So this is the importance of 25% of Christian population. And actually, I have to also add this fear that the imminent uh, going down, the imminent, uh, <coughs> I, I remember the German word, it's so interesting now. <laughs> the, the demise of the empire is on the horizon. Uh, it is uh, nothing new actually, and this was the history of 19th century. Uh, what had once, let me give you the overall picture of ninth Ottoman Empire's decline process. What had once been a magnificent empire, ruled over three countries, continents, had successfully held together all of the various religious and ethnic uh, groups within its territory. Relative to, the er to that era, you have to acknowledge Islamic culture and legal system could be considered rather progressive compared to European system of the time, it's for its high degree of tolerance. This is what the Islam today also very proud of it. But nevertheless, this tolerance did never contain an inherent notice of equality. Christian were not equals as Muslims. Combined with a variety of other factors, the empire aged, the Ottoman Empire, and was unable to respond appropriately to the growing reformist call of Christians for equality and 
freedom. This is the basic demand of the Christian within the Ottoman Empire. And the same events, because of the reason what happened in Balkan, played over and over during 19th century. And we had the following picture almost in all events, beginning with 1802 and four Serbian uprising, and then went to Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, and so on. This was a continuum. So the Christians within the empire, particularly those living in the European side, demanded equality and freedom. It was impossible to respond to those demands while remaining within Islamic culture and legal system. So the main problem was the existing Islamic culture in 19th century and the existing Islamic legal system in 19th century was not possible to give the equal rights to Christians. It was impossible. This was the main problem. And the, the existing mindset of the state bureaucrats and Islamic jurisprudence was against any idea of equality between Muslim and Christians. And so the demands for equality and social justice were often <coughs> violently suppressed by Ottoman rulers and the great power intervened. And the great powers whose self-interest lay in the disintegration of the empire, began sending humanitarian assistance. They could never say that they had certain colonial interest in the empire, and they covered up their colonial interest also as humanitarian intervention, as we're still today doing also. There is nothing more changed. And if there is a oil in, in one country, our humanitarian intervention increases. If there is no oil there, there is no humanitarian intervention. There is a close correlation between these. We all know that from every day today. And under pressure of the great powers, some concessions were made by old Ottomans, but the moment the pressure would ease, the concession would be forgotten, and none of them would be realized. This led to more insurgencies of the Christians who were demanding reform. Each uprisings was suppressed ever more forcibly and violently, and this in turn would lead to more interference from outside. This vicious cycle, this is the catch-22 situation actually, turned into a self-fulfilling prophecy for the Ottomans. The Ottomans, perceived actually the growing demands for freedom and equality by internal segments of the population as a national security threat. And but ended up creating a national security threat by not heeding those demands. It's very interesting. This is how Turkish government acts to the Kurdish demands today. They never acknowledge Kurdish demand for equality and freedom and then this is because of the reason of the uh, security concern that they have, but at the end, it really turns a se real security concern for them because they never fulfilled these demands of the Kurds. So the same mentality and mechanism works. So there is nothing new in that sense in 1913. And 1913, when it came, the only new thing was that there was a huge Muslim migration to Anatolia from Balkan. <coughs> Approximately one million Muslim escaped from Balkan. They left their houses. Some of them were massacred by Bulgarians, by Greeks, by Serbs, and they ended up in, a, in Anatolia. It was a huge Muslim migration movement, and they were on the doors of Anatolia, and it was a real security problem for them. And in the words of Enver Pasha, who is Enver Pasha? He is one of the ruling triumvirate during that period. And he, with his firm term, he says that he claimed that the non-Turkish elements, this is what they used during that period for the Christians, non-Turkish elements within the country, they show themselves to be opposed to the empire continued existence. This is what they believe. The Christians are against our nation's continuum existence. And then they also use the term internal timor. Timor, how do you call it? The body. In 
tumor. This is a, like a bacteria in the body that should be removed. And they use the term purging of this tumor from the body of Ottoman Empire. And then they were increasingly convinced that tolerating the Ottoman Christian would lead to a national collapse. Made a series of po then they made a series of policy decisions aimed at the ethno-religious homogenization of Anatolia. So the, my central argument in the book is beginning of 1913. It wasn't a genocide, a decision of genocide. It was a policy of ethno-religious homogenization of Anatolia on the Turkish Muslim identity. This was the decision. And we call this homogenization of Anatolia, or I call it in my book also, a demographic policy aimed the radical restructuring of Anatolia's population. And one more thing, this population, this population policy had two major components. One was against the Christians, and the second was against non-Turkish Muslim population. The policy against uh, the Christians was very clear, either expel them from Anatolia or massacre them. So get rid of them from Anatolia. And the policy towards non-Turkic Muslims, such as Kurds, Albanians, Bosnians, and some Arab families was assimilation, to assimilate them within Turkish Muslim culture. They really reshuffled the un entire Anatolia. They removed Armenians and Greeks from their villages. Armenians then during the war years in Syria and uh, Iraq desert, and the Greeks were removed, I'm going to talk, to Greece, and then Muslims were replaced in their places. It was a really social engineering, a demographic policy aimed to create a Turkic Muslim majority in Anatolia. So this policy resulted really in a complete change in the ethnic makeup of Anatolia. Estimated 15 million of Anatolian population of that time, 1914-15, almost one third of this population either expelled, massacred, or relocated during this period of 1913-18. So, and here is the how they did it. They developed a policy, what I called dual mechanism. And this is what they, this is the importance why I'm talking on Greeks, because it was a really an example later for the Armenian case also. A dual mechanism has mainly two components. And this policy were first implemented against Greeks in Western Anatolia and Thrace. If I go back, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, here. So basically, at the beginning of 1914, what they started is to expel the Greeks from this area around Smyrna and the Thrace up there. So this is the region that I'm talking about. And this dual mechanism, uh, on the one hand, they gave an official and legal framework to their activities for it was in form of population exchanges so everybody maybe think who are experts or knows the middle east history thinks that the first official population exchange policy was 1924 between greek greece and turkey it was not the case first official population <coughs> exchange agreements signed 1913 between serbia in 19, uh, in, first in Bulgaria, September 29, 1913, and uh, it exchanged the population along the new borderline between Turkey and Bulgaria, and we have the exact numbers, approximately 50 millions, I'm sorry, 50,000 of uh, Muslims exchanged with approximately the same number of Bulgarians 
along the uh, new border lines between both countries. And there was another agreement with Serbia, October 13, 1913, and with Greece, November 14, 1913. Some of these agreements were only confirmation of what had already occurred in the field. Because during the Balkan War, the Christians escaped to their original land. They thought they could be saved. And the Muslim escaped. And some of these agreements was only confirmation, actually, what really happened in the field. So the agreement, the legal frame, then both parties, as if they were really the Ottomans, uh, implementing a legal policy. And at the same time, they developed another policy which we call unlawful activities, or in English there is a good way of saying it, but a policy that creates a plausible deniability for the Ottoman government. So what they did, they established first special organizations. Those who know the Turkish history maybe know teşkilat Mahsusa, the special organization, were first set up end of 1913, and then this special organization, these were paramilitary units controlled by uh, party members, basically. And these special units attacked the Greek villages in the uh, coastal area. And Greeks were removed from their villages and then forced to remove to go to Greece. And they, these units plundered the, army, uh, the uh, Greek properties. They threatened to kill and forcibly evacuating the villages, and there were occasionally local massacres also. In Focha, for example, in Smyrna, this is today a wonderful tourism place. If there were a massacre, approximately 500 of Greeks were massacred 1914, June, July months, to push them. But it was not, the policy was not genocidal, because there was a country where they could send the Greeks. And they were pushed on the, uh, ships and sent to Greece. And interestingly enough, also CUP developed and uh, the party, Committee of Union and Progress Party, developed also and uh, the real the similar organizational structure for these purposes. And these codes actually some of them are the main indictment nineteen nineteen. These are not my words. These are the words of the public prosecutor, 1919, when they launched the trials against Union and Progress Party leaders. And they said that in this uh, Istanbul court martial, the prosecution stated that in line with the Union, Union and Progress Party's structure and working conditions, there was a secret network, Shebekeyi Hafiye, and there was also a uh, code of regulation, a visible and public structure of the party. So the party indeed had a legal structure, but also a secret structure and the communication throughout the party central government and the local authorities went mostly verbal. We know that throughout the Armenian genocide also, the killing orders must mostly carried by party functionaries throughout traveling the regions, never written telegram for the, uh, for the killings. So this dual mechanism was reflected in the structure of party also. So actually, you know, the, uh, the observers of the time, uh, diplomats, Morgenthau, for example, or the historian of the time, Toynbee, the, they all observed actually this dual mechanism. The Danish diplomats, the German diplomats, you can read in diplomatic reports this dual mechanism. On the one side, the legal agreement, on the other side, the illegal uh, removing of the uh, villagers, uh, the uh, Greeks from the villages. But we never had the proof of it because Ottoman authorities used during that time also this plausible deniability, saying that government didn't have anything to do with this event. These were some laws, individuals there, 
want came from Balkan, fulfilled with revenge feeling. We are trying our best to protect it, but you know, we could not do, and so on. And there was a, even 1914 summer, then when the pressure was increased on the Ottoman government, Talat, the interior minister, he was, he said, okay, let's set up a delegation. Then they set up a delegation in Istanbul, and delegation traveled throughout Anatolia, and really, government tried everything to prevent this unorganized attack against the villagers. Now, what I found, of course, what is new now, that I can show based on these secret telegrams from the interior ministry's cipher office that government directly involved in this process. And I show you only two uh, documents here to that regard. This is the one document that I'm going to talk. Extremely urgent and top secret, the document says. And uh, it is from the April 14, 1914. And Talat, the interior minister, reports that Greek villagers have assembled on the coast in great number and request that it be ensured that they emigrate by boarding steamships, but without any indication being given that the process is the result of a government directive. So do everything, but keep the government outside of this process. This is, there are dozens of these kind of telegrams. I published all these in my book. This is only an example for our uh, talk. And where they openly admit also uh, that the violence was also organized centrally, and we have a couple of telegrams that shows this also. This is again one of those telegrams, as I mentioned, you see the uh, mostly the across uh, the cities, these are the eastern provinces, because telegrams, uh, this telegram goes to western provinces, and in the telegram, uh, this is another interesting open uh, admission, and the telegram says following. It is again from November 2nd, 1914, and informed the provinces about an understanding that was reached with Germany. It is also important, the agreement with Germany was November 1st, 1914. Next day, Talat sends this telegram to the provinces regarding the policy towards Greeks. And it says, in the light of the state's current political situation, no attacks, or, or no oppression of Greeks shall be allowed as such acts of oppression against them would not be appropriate now. With the agreement, because with Germany, the reason is Germany really hoping to win, to gain Greece on, this, on their side during the First World War. So because of that reason, Germany asked explicitly Ottoman government not to touch the Greek population. Indeed, beginning 1st November 1914, Greek population as such hadn't been touched until 1917, beginning when the Russian army were marching. This is another capital of the story. So it shows how centrally everything was organized. And this really uh, gave them Another important aspect of the expulsion of the Greeks, by means of this dual mechanism, then it was possible for them, on the one hand, create the impression that it was not fully aware, the Ottoman government, of the evacuation of the Christian villages, while on the other, it was constantly and systematically the government gathering information on these abandoned villages with the full intent of settling Muslim there in their places. And really, there are dozens of communication. It published, I published an important number of them. In a steady stream of communication with the provinces, the interior ministry would ask for information regarding the number, location, conditions, and hab habitual capacity of the villages, data on emigration, Immigration and resettlement were not limited to population counts. 
Instead, really detailed information was often requested on the social and economic character of the areas in question, such as the location and condition of abandoned lands, the traits of those living and arriving, and the character of their existing businesses. This is the uh, one telegram uh, then from uh, June 1913. Please, then telegram says, report on how many Greeks have emigrated from your province up to now, from how many township and villages, and from how many specific dwellings, what are the names of the villages and townships, the numbers of dwellings, the type and size of the fields that they have left, the amount of communal and private agriculture, and the type of industry and agriculture production in which they were engaged, and if Muslim immigrants have been partially resettled these places following the original owner immigration, how many of these will be left where they are? Explicit detailed reports from the local authorities to central government, and this was a really explicitly detailed demographic policy started with the Greeks and then continued, of course, with Armenians. So uh, I'm not going to talk on the uh, Armenian part because uh, uh, it's maybe a better question. And uh, in answer period, I can go into detail. But let me say a couple of words on the Armenian genocide aspect of the issue. So the <laughs> overall, the policy was planned before the war started. Again, it was not a policy of genocide. It was not a policy of total extermination of Christians. But the policy was to find the ways and devices to get rid of Christians from Anatolia. So in case of Greeks, it was easy. You have a country, you can put them on the ships and send them to Greece. Where are you going to send the Armenians? Did they have a state? Yes, they did. To your information, at the beginning, they seriously considered to send the Armenians into Russia. And they gave up this idea. Why? In their communication, we read, they say, when we send the Armenians to Russia, they will join the Russian army and will come back again. So this is number one, why the population policy against Armenian had to be genocidal, because there was no place to send the Armenians. A second important reason, in case of Armenian, why it had to be genocidal. 1914 February, they signed an agreement with Russia, a reform agreement. Based on this reform agreement, there should have been two autonomous provinces in Eastern Anatolia. And based on this reform agreement, they already also agreed that two foreigners should come to the region as governors. One Norwegian and one Dutch officers came also as governor of the, these two Armenian provinces, new established Armenian provinces. What was the other rules? 50% of the police, 50% of the gendarmerie should from Armenians and also Ad Armenians should be part of administrative, civil administration if their number exceeds 10% of the local Muslim population. So, then, according to this agreement also, they decided to launch a new census, population census. And when they signed this agreement, 1914 February, they already knew, not only the Ottomans, but the friends, <coughs> Russians, and the others, that this was the beginning of an independent Armenian state. Because this was the way how they lost Serbia, how they lost Bosnia-Herzegovina, how they lost Bulgaria, Romania, and they were so scared. If they had implemented this plan, there would have been a beginning of an independent Armenian state. It should be prevented to any 
cost. When they entered the war, 1914 November, first thing that Ottoman government did to annual reform agreement. This was their first job to do. And then another important factor came, 1915 February, January, February, they lost a major battle in Caucasus against Russian, Sarıkamış battle. Almost 80,000 Ottoman soldiers were destroyed by coal, weather, and by Russian army. And the gates, of course, was open for the Russian army. They could enter the area, and what was the expectation? Russian would implement the reform agreement. It was not a coincidence. The deportation of Armenians, the decision for it, started really after the loss of Sarıkamış battle 1915. And there was another war going on on Dardalen, and uh, it was also another threat for the empire. So in order to save their territories, they thought the best thing is to exterminate the Armenian population. And this is then what they did, 19, beginning of 1915 April. And throughout this period, it is another interesting topic, which I cannot go now in the detail. They not only physically annihilated the Armenian population, they also used extensively the policy of assimilation. This is maybe something unusual. Nobody dealt with this, and there are some reasons for this. But there was a get very targeted assimilation policy towards Armenian children. And they were allowed cons cons uh, con con conversion. So the Armenians were allowed at the beginning of the uh, deportation month to convert to Muslim religion. And then, but it was banned. And the second important way, one, number one, the religious conversion, and the second way of assimilation was taken away. This is the telegram that I showed you. Armenian children from the families and distributed this among Turkish families. This was the policy that they used very extensively. Maybe I show you one document and stop here. Oh, I'm sorry. Anyhow, it says that I should stop. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> so we can <laughs> continue. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>